You're listening to The Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another edition of The Corbett Report Podcast. I'm your host, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, coming to you, as always, from the sunny climes of Western Japan, here on this 7th day of March, 2014. Welcome back to the Corbett Report podcast. This is episode 290, The Enemy of My Enemy. So there I was earlier this week, working away diligently on my soon-to-be-released Federal Reserve documentary when what should arrive in my inbox but a link to a YouTube video which I, in my naivete, clicked without the foreknowledge that what I was clicking on was the journalistic sign-off heard around the world. Before we wrap up the show, I wanted to say something from my heart about the ongoing political crisis in Ukraine and Russia's military occupation of Crimea. Just because I work here for RT doesn't mean I don't have editorial independence. And I can't stress enough how strongly I am against any state intervention in a sovereign nation's affairs. What Russia did is wrong. I admittedly don't know as much as I should about Ukraine's history or the cultural dynamics of the region, but what I do know is that military intervention is never the answer. And I will not sit here and apologize or defend military aggression. Furthermore, the coverage I've seen of Ukraine has been truly disappointing from all sides of the media spectrum and rife with disinformation. Above all, my heart goes out to the Ukrainian people who are now wedged as pawns in the middle of a global power chess game. They're the real losers here. All we can do now is hope for a peaceful outcome for a terrible situation and prevent another full-blown Cold War between multiple superpowers. Until then, I'll keep telling the truth as I see it. Have a good night, everyone. I'll see you back here to break the set tomorrow. And there it was. Now, I'm going to ask the indulgence of the listeners to give me leeway in this episode to address what was said in this particular statement, not vis-a-vis the Ukraine crisis and the facts that were or were not manipulated and how they were distorted in that statement, nor by looking at the mainstream media circus that this statement inevitably caused with MSM mouthpiece after mouthpiece piling on to the RT reporters against RT anti-Russian propaganda that this pre- conveniently provided them, nor to the inevitable follow-up that f- that came less than 24 hours later with the <gasps> shock, gasp, awe, horror, Abby Martin is a 9-11 truther, I won't. I don't want to talk about any of those subjects today, although they're all very, very interesting subjects, and I'm sure you have heard already a lot of talk about them in the alternative media. But I want to approach what we just saw as a statement of ethical principle, because that is the exact way in which I read that clip when I first saw it. In fact, I saw this clip when it was freshly minted on YouTube, hot off the press, and... At that time, it was not a viral video, it was not generating all this controversy, it was not the top of Google News, and it didn't really cross my mind that this was going to become that type of story. And that's because, I guess in my complete naivete, I didn't really read this in terms of the propaganda war that's going on right now in ter- uh, re- uh, surrounding the Ukrainian crisis. I read this actually as a statement of journalistic principles, and as such, I I respect it, and I think I even adhere to a similar guideline, which is to say that I have the ethical uh, principle that I am not for military intervention. I do not believe it is a solution to any geopolitical crisis. I do not think that military intervention should be used, occupation, boots on the ground, sending troops in to try to help a country uh, sort out its own democracy etc etc I do not believe that that is the answer and I do not support it whenever it happens now of course I do disagree and differ with the interpretation of what's happening in Crimea right now and and whether or not there is a military occupation or whether Russian troops have really been sent in or whether they already exist under terms of an existing bilateral agreement between Crimea and the autonomous region of Crimea and the Russian government and all of the nuance and subtlety and complexity, which Abby Martin in that clip admitted that she did not know, which is fine. She does not know that. So she is commenting not on the situation per se, but on the ethical principle, on the guideline, on the norm that we do not uh, support the idea of military intervention in, in any of such circumstance. And I, I agree. I agree with that principle. I just disagree in the way that she's talking about it in the Ukrainian crisis in particular. So 
I didn't see this as particularly controversial, uh, perhaps regrettable in the way that it was phrased or the way that um, Abby was speaking about something that she admittedly did not understand. But still, I didn't see the, the controversy factor of this. Now, having watched all of this develop over the past week and the Liz Wall resignation just adding to this and, and upping the ante, and I will not get into that today here either, because again, that's slightly beside the point, but having watched what became of this, it now makes perfect sense to me that, of course, this was the golden opportunity to start a, a certain meme that would be picked up on and, and uh, used for propagandistic purposes in the Western media to, of course, once again, portray portray the Russian side of this as an aggressor in this game of global geopolitics that is being played right now between the Western, U.S.-aligned, NATO-backed states and Russia. And uh, again, I think we all understand how that game works. So, again, having seen the way that it's developed, well, I guess none of that is particularly surprising. But, again, this is an exceptionally important point that she has made in this, in this clip, uh, uh, not, not about the, again, not about the specifics of Ukraine, but about the general principle that is involved here. And again, I'd just like to stress, this is a general principle that I support and that I feel strongly about, especially at this moment in time, especially as we are dealing with an event as important as what is happening in Ukraine right now, not insofar as it is important. Of course, it is important for the Ukrainian people, first and foremost, but it is also, as we all understand by now, basically a big piece of the chessboard that is up for grabs right now, or so the great geopolitical superpowers would want us to believe, in this game of chess that's taking place. And both players on the table are attempting to position their piece to make sure that it has the best or biggest slice of that square of the chessboard. Not a very perfect analogy, sorry for that, but you understand what I'm saying. And... It's exactly that mentality, this one side versus another fighting over a square of the chessboard that, oh yeah, just happens to be populated by all these people. They're just pawns on, they're not even pawns, they're sub-pawns on this chessboard. They're, they're just sort of the, 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 the terrain of the chessboard. They're, they're not even that important. And that, of course, is sickening and disgusting because that is the exact type of reasoning that can be used to per perpetrate the worst types of mass slaughter and, of course, eventually to set off some sort of great confrontation i.e. World War III, and it perhaps is no coincidence that we are here 100 years after the beginning of World War I, and we are seeing, well, very similar uh, types of geopolitical patterns taking place there in Eastern Europe as those that originally set off the Great War, the war to end all wars. But what is our role in this? Are we passive spectators to these events that are taking place on this geopolitical chessboard who simply and only get to decide which of the two players in this chess game we are going to support? I would like to posit today that that is not the case. That in fact, even if this is some sort of global geopolitical chess game taking place between Team Russia and Team NATO, or however you want to divide those teams out, that that is a false dichotomy that has been force-fed into us, not just by the mainstream, but by the majority of the alternative as well, who all buy into that fundamental assumption that, to boil it down to the most simplistic level, the most simplistic propagandistic level, it's Obama versus Putin, and and that is the, the, the two sides of this equation which we have to choose between. I am here to tell you today, in case you did not know, that that is a complete lie. And the more we are backed into that corner, the more that works to our detriment. Because we will only support and go along with and eventually play right into the war agenda if we believe that to be true. I do not believe that to be true. There are not just two sides here. This is not a, a game of struggle between two players, and we do not have to choose teams like we are spectators to a sporting event. This is much, much more important than that. And just to, to show that point, this is something that I've in fact been thinking about doing ever since the Corbett Report podcast went on hiatus in late December. I've been thinking about doing a podcast on this subject. In fact, I've been thinking about it for months and months now, but this is a prime opportunity to talk about this subject, namely that 
I've seen the disturbing tendency in a lot of the alternative media to paint anyone who's going against the the New World Order, globalist war agenda, whatever you want to call it, I think we understand what that is, the NATO boots-on-the-ground invasion of X, Y, or Z. Uh, anyone who goes against that is automatically portrayed as some sort of hero or savior. So, for example, well, Putin is definitely one of those players on the chessboard that's standing up to this NATO aggression. Therefore, he's the good guy. Therefore, we must support him. I know that not everyone is involved in that psychology, but I have seen that creeping in, even if only as a subliminal suggestion, often enough that I do begin to see a rather disturbing pattern, and one that I think needs to be nipped in the bud before we get into this freight train roller coaster hell ride to, to Hades that is going straight towards a possible World War III scenario. And let's just take a moment to reflect on the fact that, yes, people like, for example, let's use the example today of Putin, has certainly done things in recent months and years that are laudable in terms of averting outright military conflict in certain situations, most notably perhaps in Syria, which was definitely avoided by some deft bit of international dipl diplomatic maneuvering by Putin. And there are other examples besides where Putin certainly seems to be the shrewder operator in this game between Putin and the West, or however, again, we want to frame that uh, particular dichotomy. And this is something that has been expressed time and time again in the alternative media in recent months, not only in various alternative media outlets, but even here on the Corbett Report. Putin, in terms of his national policies, is, I think, less interesting to the Western powers. But what Putin represents to them is a block to their uh, interests everywhere from Syria to South Asia to the uh, Pacific Ocean. What a masterstroke of, of geopolitical genius here from, from Putin. I have to give uh, to take my hats off to this because this is the type of thing which, if anything, will ever humanize the Russians to the average American. I don't think Putin will be very anxious to get involved in a war. As I said earlier, I think he'll just sit there <coughs> prepared or better prepared and let events unfold. And if a reasonable government uh, shapes up in Ukraine, he will accept it, negotiate with it, uh, try to reach arrangements that are in both countries' interests. Well, I think uh, when all circumstances are considered, the uh, Putin and Lavrov team have shown remarkable restraint in, in the situation. I think the... Uh, the financial uh, support that Russia promised of the 15 billion purchase of Ukrainian bonds when things were, were uh, relatively more stable and uh, when uh, Yanukovych was still president, uh, that has been put on indefinite hold pending what comes out as a coalition government now. I think that's uh, the right decision to make. As I say, this narrative will not be unfamiliar to regular listeners and viewers of the alternative media. I'm sure we've all seen statements like this creeping up with more and more frequency, with a greater and greater frequency in recent years. And the tendency, the overall tendency of these accumulated statements is to look as if it is an apolo apologia for the actions of Putin and the Russian government and perhaps even complete outright support. Now, I certainly don't speak for any of the people in these clips as to whether or not they do support this proposition that Putin is a good guy and one we should get on board with. But as I say, this is the tendency of this narrative that is gradually being constructed in the alternative media, and I think it needs to be fundamentally questioned. Now, it is difficult when we start looking at the skeletons in Putin's closet that do exist and that do counter this narrative of Putin as a wonderful savior of humanity who's acting completely from altruistic love of humanity to further the, the, the cause of people of the world and their natural rights or whatever the, uh, the ultimate idea here is supposed to be. Uh, it is important for us to distinguish between the valid criticisms of Putin and what he's doing to, in, in Russia and through his foreign policy from the propaganda narrative that is being 
constructed against him because certainly, again, I think we can all see that propaganda narrative being constructed. And of course, most obviously, most recently in the Ukrainian crisis, the propaganda has been at ridiculous and overt levels. And uh, this, of course, can take the form of just simple hypocrisy. Hypocrisy to a, uh, it would be funny if it wasn't so absolutely outrageous degree. This is an act of aggression that is uh, completely trumped up in terms of its pretext. Uh, it's really 19th century behavior in the 21st century. And, you know, the reason for this, uh, David, is because you just don't invade another country on phony pretext uh, in order to assert your interests. The idea of one of the lawmakers who voted for the Iraq war trying to tell people that it is illegal to invade countries on any pretext is, again, just so ridiculous that you could not write this script with a straight face if you were trying to write the most outrageous thing imaginable. And it is a pretty tight com competition for that title of the most outrageous thing imaginable when it comes to the absurd anti-Russian propaganda that has creeped up in recent years in, a, in accord with the rise of this Putin uh, block on the chessboard to NATO aggression. And again, we can see this in a lot of different ways. One of them, of course, being the absurd propaganda sur surrounding the ridiculous, uh, well, propaganda coup of the Pussy Riot arrests and, uh, and imprisonment and political martyrdom that has taken place in the Western media, much to the detriment of the IQ of most of the um, Western media's readers and viewers. And uh, that's a, a long story involving a lot of sham celebrity uh, prostitutes and uh, and NGOs that are just looking for, um, well, I mean, in the case of the celebrities, obviously looking for the reflected fame and glory of pretending to have some sort of human rights cause to stand behind. And in the case of the NGOs, of course, feeding into the anti-Russian propaganda narrative that's taking place right now. So that, for example, the best breakdown of this uh, that's available might be something like uh, John Justice's P Pussy Riot propaganda is for naive Americans. And I'll leave uh, that for you to read on your own so you can read about some of these NGOs and groups that are pushing this ridiculous propaganda. And uh, then, of course, we've seen all of the anti Russia is anti gay uh, uh, sentiment that's been popping up and, of course, made. Um, was the story of the Sochi 2014 Olympics. And again, this is a story that is 97% fabrication and based on basically uh, the, the media's uh, belief that you are too stupid to go out and actually read any of this legislation for yourself or look into any of this yourself. There have been a lot of people who have been exposing the lies that have been told surrounding this subject. So I'll throw a link into an excellent video where Paul Joseph Watson breaks this down with help from a uh, list of points about this supposed anti-gay uh, propaganda or uh, legislation coming down in Russia that in fact does not mention sexuality or, or sexual orientation at all and has nothing to do with uh, overt anti-gay legislation and yet it is being portrayed that way in a media that, again, expects you to just to be to credulously believe whatever they say. And we could go on. There are other examples out there of the kind of ridiculous, over-the-top anti-Russian propaganda that is becoming more and more the norm in even pseudo-alternative, uh, I think you all know the foundation-funded alternative media sources that are happy to play along with scripts like these when their billionaire foundation-funded uh, supporters tell them to. Um, so I am not denying any of that. But having said all of that and, have, and knowing that, as, as we do, that Russia is one of the targets of this propaganda, and not just propaganda, but of actual stirring up of tensions and terrorism in places like Chechnya, Gla Operation Gladio B, bringing the war on terror to Russia's doorstep in Central Asia and the Caucasus, and all of these moves on the geopolitical chessboard that we know are taking place to target Putin and target Russia, that does not mean that Putin and Russia are blameless, 
are perfect, spotless angels in all of this. That does not mean that we have to support their over them overall as as wonderful people and who are acting in the best interests of humanity because they are not. And in order to understand that, I think we should look at some of the very valid criticisms of Putin and what he is doing in Russia that do exist out there and that do need to be put on the table and that we've put on the table before. For example, back in December of 2012, where we looked at that mysterious little plane crash that killed most of the Polish government and, oh yeah, just happened to do so right on the doorstep of a very sad World War II memorial for the Polish people in their struggle against the Soviets. Yes, as unbelievable as it may seem, there is now, well, confirmation that, in fact, bodies have been swapped around and other bodies have had their remains desecrated during the autopsy process, etc. So certainly a, a distinct lack of respect for the bodies of these people have been shown in the investigation of what happened and the uh, the vict victims' families have been denied the ability to exhume their the remains of their loved ones for a long time, presumably to stop them from finding out about this desecration, etc. So a very bizarre state of affairs, and in this investigation time and time again, it seems to come back to the fact that it was the Russians who were in charge of the airport, it was the Russians who took over the investigation, it was the Russians who have de denied the, uh, the family members and others access to the important data in this case, and a lot of these roads lead back to Mother Russia. Now why is that? Another aspect of this that does not get reported on by the alternative media that seeks to pose Putin as some sort of wonderful crusading savior of humanity are, is the unbelievably repressive legislation that he continues to pass quite quietly against the Russian people, not the trumped up phony uh, legislation that's being used as the propaganda uh, in the propaganda machine, but legislation that really does mirror exactly what's going on in the United States and elsewhere in the Western world as the national security state grows in, uh, in, uh, with every passing year from the false phony false flag 9-11 inside job event. Oh, did I say 9-11 was an inside job? Oh, I better retract that if the MSM ever wants to talk to me. Um, no, not, not just because of, of that, but because of the actual repressive legislation that continues to be passed that, again, is just a little too, too much like the legislation that's being passed and, and considered in the United States uh, for the MSM in the Western media ever to report on it. What am I talking about? Well, stories like this one that comes from Ria Novosti in June, on June 11th of 2013 Putin pro proposes using smart cameras to identify immigrants. But there are many, 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 many other pieces in this puzzle. And this particular story was, uh, was covered well in a very brief seg segment on a recent Truth Loader video about surprising facts about Putin, not all of which I agree with, but this one I certainly do. Vladimir Putin has been accused of creating the worst human rights climate in post-Soviet Russia. Since his most recent presidential inauguration in 2012, he's introduced the following. The protest law, which has severely limited the rights of people wishing to hold a public demonstration. The internet content law, which gives Russian government powers to block websites entirely or restrict access if content's deemed unsuitable. He's reintroduced criminal libel laws which impose huge fines on media outlets that report statements that later turn out to be false. He's broadened the definition of treason and increased the punishment. Speaking of draconian and tyrannical legislation being passed by Putin and his uh, puppets in the Russian Duma, how about uh, the story like this one that comes from Reuters in December of last year? Putin dissolves state news agency, tightens grip on Russia media. Quote, President Vladimir Putin tightened his control over Russia's media on Monday by dissolving the main state news agency and replacing it with an organization that is to promote Moscow's image abroad. The move to abolish Ria Novosti and create a news agency to be known as Rossiya Segodnia is his second in two weeks strengthening Putin's hold on the media as he tries to reassert his authority after protests against his rule. End quote. So... 
Again, just another piece of the puzzle, and one that is as disturbing as any war on uh, journalism that's happening in the United States, it's also happening in Russia. And in Russia, if you report on the wrong things, just like someone like a Michael Hastings, who ends up dying in a fiery death um, when talking about <laughs> reporting on big secrets of the FBI, CIA, and NSA, the exact same thing's happening in Russia. More than a dozen Russian journalists have been killed during the term of President Putin. The latest of them, Anna Politkovskaya, had repeatedly lambasted Russia for committing numerous war crimes in Chechnya, denouncing Vladimir Putin personally for crushing liberty. A Russian television journalist was found strangled in his Moscow apartment on Friday. Police say the body of Ilya Sapayev was found by firefighters when they arrived to put out a fire in his apartment. Sapayev was strangled with a belt and his attackers set his apartment on fire. Russia is already one of the world's most dangerous places for journalists. A fact brought home in the early hours of Saturday morning for top newspaper reporter Oleg Kashin. Near his Moscow apartment, two men set upon Kashin, breaking both legs, fingers and his jaw. An attack that has left him in an induced coma. That isn't enough. How about Russia's own 9-11, which of course happened in the 1999 wave of apartment bombings in Moscow and surrounding areas that was really Russia's 9-11 and was used as a justification not only, of course, to up the ante in Chechnya, but also for a young budding Putin to consolidate his grip on power during the changeover from Yeltsin to Putin there at the turn of the millennium, or not quite the turn of the millennium, but you know what I'm saying. Uh, well, that also, of course, was just like 9-11, a false flag that was designed to help perpetuate an idea of a mythical war on terror. And of course, against Osama bin Laden was one of the figures that was raised as the specter of the boogeyman behind attacks like that one on the Russian motherland. And also, of course, to help consolidate the political power of people like Putin. And a major operation involving all the members of the Russian Federation was jointly planned by the police and the FSB. The operation was codenamed Anti-Terror Whirlwind. It was signed by Petrushev and Rushailo. Even high-ranking Secret Service officers had difficulty supporting the exercise version of events. I don't get it. Why did it take two whole days to tell the world it was an exercise? Frankly, it's incomprehensible. Well, it's obvious. We wanted to check the logical follow-through of our operation, including the hunt method to the terrorists. That's why we didn't reveal it was an exercise. Right, but you couldn't have told Rochelo? Well, you know, things can sometimes get muddled during an exercise. Anyway, during the exercise, we were checking our systems and the systems of the Interior Ministry. Well, can you believe this? Rushailo says it was a great achievement, and half an hour later, Patrushev says, oh no, it was just an exercise. But Vladimir Putin found himself in an even more awkward position. He had also announced that a bombing had been thwarted. Had the Prime Minister known about the exercises in Ryazan? The notion that until Patrushev's announcement on the 24th of September, Prime Minister Putin didn't know about any exercise being held in Russia is improbable. If that was the case, Putin would have had to sack Patrushev the moment he heard that the exercise was being held in Ryazan, because it would have meant that Patrushev had not only misled the whole country, but Putin too. Patrushev didn't lose his job. So Putin must have known that Patrushev was holding an exercise in Ryazan on the blowing up of an apartment block. The members of the Ryazan FSB were not informed about the operation run from Moscow because of the need for secrecy. But they had seen with their own eyes that the detonator and the explosives were genuine. They found themselves in a very tricky situation. To put it mildly, Sergeyev wasn't pleased. In fact, he was beside himself with rage. After all, in this case, his professional pride as a member of the special services had been trampled in the dirt. 
How could an FSB general not know what was going on in his own patch? Even worse, now the Moscow bosses were trying to force the local Ryazan FSB to change their game completely. And then, to cover themselves and separate themselves from the actions of the center, the local secret service men published an absolutely unique statement. I would say this document is concrete proof of the involvement of the FSB in the Ryazan attack. I'm going to read these few lines from the Ryazan FSB statement. It has been made known that an imitation detonator, discovered on the 22nd of September, was part of a joint operation. This announcement came as a surprise to us. It came out just as our agents had identified the place where the bombers were living in Ryazan and were preparing to arrest them. It was precisely at this moment that Patrushev replaced the real attack story with the exercise theory. What, that still isn't enough to convince you that Putin might not be acting from the most altruistic purposes and that he might not really have as his end goal the wonderful peace and kumbaya of all nations being comprised of self-determined sovereign people acting in, in unison and independence and happiness and sunshine? Uh, well, wait, it gets even worse. Um, of course, what is the argument that people use to posit Putin as some sort of savior or hero? It is to say, well, at the very least, he's against the NATO war globalism agenda. He's against the banksters. He's against the creation of this global government that we know this is all heading toward. And I say absolutely not. Just as in every other time of history, the big macro picture is being manipulated to make us choose between two false sides so that no matter which side we choose. Everything comes up roses for the banksters. Even if they were to lose control and one of the sides takes over, it doesn't matter because they're both lusting after the same agenda. And how do we see the beginnings of that agenda? Well, for example, let's take this report from March of 2011. Russia's Putin says wants to build Eurasian Union. Quote, Russia's Prime Minister Vladimir Putin said he wants to bring ex-Soviet states into a Eurasian Union in an article which outlined his first foreign policy initiative as he prepares to return to the Kremlin as the country's next president. Putin said the new union would build on an existing customs union with Belarus and Kazakhstan, which from next year will remove all barriers to trade, capital, and labor move movement between the three countries. End quote. Again, you can go and read the rest of that report. You can read other reports surrounding this particular project. But where have we heard that before? A customs and a trade union that turns into a political union, a supranational union is the a, a phrase that's that's been used specifically in relation to this proposed Eurasian union. Uh, where have we heard that? Oh, that's right, the European Union, which, again, stemmed from the exact same type of treaty that flew under the radar because it was just a little treaty on trade between a few of the European nations that 50 years later they were celebrating as, hey, this is the European Union, and it's been that way all along. And on the other side of that coin, hey, we can celebrate the Eurasian Union and the loss of sovereignty of peoples all around the world in these big, overarching globalist institutions and for anyone who thinks that, oh, well, that was 2011 and it's not going on now, well, just from this week on Eurasianet.org, March 5th, 2014, Putin turns attention to Eurasian Union. Quote, After offering a coldly efficient example in, in Ukraine of the use of hard power, Russia's paramount leader, Vladimir Putin, is turning his attention to shoring up Moscow's soft power capabilities, namely keeping his vision for Eurasian unification on track. There are signs, however, that his Eurasian aspirations will be more difficult to fulfill than his Crimean land grab. Putin on March 5th covered a snap summit, convened a snap summit in Moscow, also attended by Kazakhstan's Nursultan Nazarbayev and Belarus's Alexander Lukashenko. The meeting's aim was perhaps more propagandistic than substantive, designed mainly as a show of diplomatic support amid Western efforts to isolate and punish Russia for what critics see as it. Uh, as its de facto occupation of the Crimean Peninsula. At the same time, it provided Putin an opportunity to test his cohort's resolve to press ahead with integration. Russia, Kazakhstan, and Belarus are currently co-joined in a customs union. End quote. Now, 
that is a perfect example of what I'm talking about. That particular article coming from Eurasianet.org, which really is a site that you have to use with caution, because of course they do report on facts and things that are actually happening, but they also have their own propagandistic uh, perspective that comes from their own funding and backing, which I'll let you look into for yourselves. But the point is that this is nested propaganda. So the propaganda in there that we see, the Crimean land grab type rhetoric that again is trying to make us believe that what's happening in Crimea right now is some sort of anti-democratic uh, uh, military clampdown when in fact it's the exact opposite and flipped around and what's happening in Ukraine right now is the overthrow of democratic institutions and with Crimea, the autonomous region of Crimea is trying to once again re return to Russia where it has historically uh, resided, blah blah blah, etc, etc. You know how all that works. So that's the, the, the propaganda at the first level but then the second level is then and, well, for people like us who don't go along with that propaganda, that must mean that Putin's the good guy and this Eurasian Union must be a good thing. No. What is happening here is we are being offered a feces sandwich and it's being cut in half. And, we're sa and they're saying to us, look, you can have this half of the feces sandwich or this half of the feces sandwich. And here's the best part. You get to choose which half you're going to eat. No, thank you. I am, for one, am not going to take a bite out of that sandwich at all, because that is not the only thing on the dinner plate. We can choose other things rather than the feces sandwich they're trying to hand us. We do not have to line up and put our, 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 ourselves, our, our independence, our, our own thoughts, our minds, our effort, our energies, our support behind one of these phony, fake globalist institutions or their puppet mouthpieces. And I don't know how else to put it. I don't know how much more blatantly it needs to be said that just because someone is the enemy of our enemy does not mean that they're our friend. This is a topic that I covered last night on the Corbett Report when I talked to, to Ryan Dawson here in Japan. All right, well, I guess just the point that I'm trying to get at here is that there are an awful lot of skeletons in this closet, and it just seems to me that a lot of people are being pushed into that that uh, dichotomy that you were talking about, that, oh, the Chinese and Russians are standing up, therefore they're the good ones. And I, I guess my point is that this needs to be confronted, and it needs to be confronted now, because we really are being pushed into, at the very least, whatever they're calling it, the new Cold War, or whatever they're trying to call it at the moment, and the battle lines are being drawn right now, and we collectively, the human species is being asked to take sides in this as if there is a side to take which is not bloody and disgusting and uh, and one that I don't want to take. And uh, I think it's important that we consciously make the decision not to put our lot in with one of these bloody brutali brut brutality-driven regimes um, just because, well, you've got to be for something. You've got to be for one of these sides. No, there are other ways... Exactly right. And here we are on 100 years later, and we've seen this, this sort of shades of World War I starting to, to reappear. And what does this mean? Where does this put us? How did we get suckered collectively into World War I in the first place? It's because people slept, walked into it. And maybe maybe they were, 100 years ago, they had the excuse that they hadn't seen anything like that before. But we've seen it. We've lived through this um, collectively um, for, for generations now. We've seen this happening over and over again. And I think there's got to be a way for us to, to make that mental decision not to put our lot in with one of these two sides before it becomes too late. Um, on that note, I, I, are, are there any anything that you would like to suggest to the audience or any sources that you think are, are important in regards to keeping ourselves above this fray? I, I think for your audience, since it's an intelligent audience, what something they ought to do is go back and look at why Ukraine is in the financial condition that it's in to begin with, because the political crisis was predicated on the financial crisis. And so you're going to have to see, well, why did they accept so many loans and who did it and what was it for and where did the money go? Because right now, they, they won't be able to pay their bills for another two weeks. They don't have any money. I mean, they can get a, a second loan to pay for the first loan, and a third loan to pay for like that sort of system. But you have to see understand the financial problems first and then resources and just ignore the, what's on television, that theatrical stuff. I mean, that's the, the, there was a good article in Politico, believe it or not, um, called Disaster Porn uh, that I recommend people read. It was by a... Um, Sarah or Susan Ken, just look up disaster porn Politico and you can find that. And but I mean I don't know 
I, I can tell you the sources that I read, but I don't really have like fixed sources. I just sort of read around and I, I use my head and say, well, does that make sense or not with everything else I know? And, and there aren't really any sources that are always accurate. I mean, it's sort of yeah. hit or miss. So well, I don't really yeah. have a... I don't have a formula, but well, I, no, I think that is the the answer that we have to use. Use your head, and unfortunately, there's just no shortcut to that, and it involves a lot of digging. And one of the the points that I would put on the table there is to take a look at who is now assuming power in the newly formed Ukrainian government. And you look at uh, figures like Ihor Kolomoisky, who I'm probably mispronouncing there, who's just become the uh, the newly minted governor of Neprop. Petrovsk, which I'm definitely mispronouncing, but it's the uh, industrial. Oh, he's a um, a Stefan Bandera. Uh, uh, just he thinks he's an absolute hero, and this guy was a the, I guess you could say the, the Nazi in charge in the Ukraine. He was Ukrainian, but yeah, and they they just heroicize him, and it's it's again just what we were talking about. Yeah, the Russians killed millions of people in Ukraine, so a lot of them jumped on the German side as liberators, but. Hitler wasn't. He didn't give a damn about Ukrainians. He actually suggested uh, privately that, you know, assuming he was going to win, that when they opened up the schools there, they were only going to educate them enough to read the road signs and the minimal level and drown them in academic minutia, but make sure that they're never going to threaten uh, German engineers or anybody. I mean, they they're so... Machiavellian and disgustingly evil, and people get suckered for it. Oh, that team hurt me, so I'm going to jump on this other psychopath side it's uh it's so true and uh, again there are so many different points that we could uh, put in into that matrix to show that people are constantly being suckered in again and again and every time they think they're getting out of it by just joining another group it's it turns out that group of course is just using their membership as a springboard and a catapult to consolidating their own power so um again it's it's oligarchs getting into power who are replacing uh, the uh, the old cronies who were in power before uh, again yanukovych uh, uh, versus uh, yushchenko i mean yeah I, Again, <laughs> either side of a of a feces sandwich is not tasty to me. <laughs> yeah, the old gas princess and everything else. Exactly. And, yeah, exactly. it's it's just. I mean, I'm glad you see it, and but it is frustrating, and I wish I had like a quick formula or answer on how to to get people to think more critically and not get stuck in these kind of games. But I mean, if I could answer that, we. You know, <laughs> we could change a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Well, hopefully this conversation goes some way to at least getting people thinking along that path. And that's the first part. A, a cognitive liberty comes one person at a time, and it comes from people refusing to accept the, the main narratives that are being propounded, either the mainstream narratives or the alternative narratives. We have to look critically at both sides and come to our own decisions and perhaps find a third way. And so, my friends, in an attempt to put this in a way that will go uber viral and will allow me to go on mainstream outlets like Piers Morgan and proudly declare that 9-11 was an inside job, um, I would like to offer the, my heartfelt opinion that military intervention is always wrong, that it is not the answer, that we do not have to support it simply because one military side is lined up against another military side. It doesn't matter lesser of two evils arguments. It doesn't matter the two quoque fallacies that are always trotted out at times like this. Well, Putin isn't as bad as the West. Uh, Russia isn't as bad. They don't kill as many people. That is not the point. Again, that is a false dichotomy that people are buying into willingly because they do not understand the logical fallacy of two quoque. I'll include a link for you to check that out. And basically, again, all I can reiterate is to say that we are being offered the feces sandwich and I'm, I'm asking you, are you going to take a bite from it or are you going to look somewhere else to eat? Come to think of it, that probably isn't going to go viral, is it? Oh, wait. Well, we're going to leave things there. And as I say, I am diligently working on the Federal Reserve documentary, but I did have to take time out to address this topic that is breaking right now and really is important as we stand at the cusp of another Cold War and or World War III and or however else this is being portrayed right now, because we are being railroaded into choosing one or the other side in this contest. And if we do so, we put ourselves on the path towards that military confrontation. We put ourselves and our identity and we invest ourselves in it so that we feel in some way that we own or we we have this military confrontation it's ours that we choose a team that we root for the team and 
either side that we support in that is not going to be to our favor in the end. And on that note, that's going to do it for this week's episode of the Corbett Report podcast. I'm going to be back very soon with the Federal Reserve documentary, and we will be resuming regular podcasts here on CorbettReport.com in the very near future. I hope you'll stick with me till then. And until then, I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. Thank you for joining me. Talk to you again real soon. The Corbett Report is brought to you by The Corbett Report subscriber. A weekly newsletter featuring James Corbett's international forecaster editorial, recommended reading and viewing, discounts on Corbett Report DVDs, and once a month, a subscriber-only video. Sign up today to start receiving your copy at corbettreport.com support.